Welcome back, Dixie. Um, hope everything went okay with um, NTI the first couple of days. I know it was a struggle. I know it was a process. I know a lot of you guys have emailed me multiple times due with the heart diagram, getting that information in. Um, I apologize for any rough spots, but uh, we're all going to get through this together. Um, just remember, those PowerPoint notes are for you all. You guys can print them out, write down notes on them and a hard copy. And then we will be having a test later this week. Um, and so, you, you know, feel free to study those, use those, do whatever you need to do to make sure that you're ready for all the content and for that test. So um, anyway, day five of NTI here. So happy Monday to all of you. And if you're watching this early, you know, feel free to always work ahead. I love the fact that you guys are doing that. Um, I'm going to try to make my videos a little bit shorter and more condensed, but I got to do one thing here before we, we, we move on to the next topic. And um, I want to go back to Thursday's topic. I mean, we talked about cardiovascular, cardiovascular system, and we talked about your blood. And we know we got red blood cells and we got white blood cells, and we'll get into more about those in a moment. But we also talked about platelets. And as, as platelets is a wonderful thing, as it clots blood, anytime we have a cut, Nick, that it comes to our defense, comes to our aid, it can also hurt us when it comes to cardiovascular disease. Those clots inside our arteries, when, um, we, when those plates, excuse me, platelets rush to that area and then that clot um, displaces and that's when we can have um, that clot in, end up in some of those um, where the lipids and those triglycerides and our arteries have narrowed and it gets stuck there. That's when we have that heart attack. But I want to talk about platelets here for a second because I want this to be authentic. And um, I got a story here about my son and um, it's always near and dear to my heart. So Again, I'm going to try to keep the video short, so I'm going to let me get right to it. My son at the time was 11 months old at the time. And one day he woke up and I came downstairs and my, my wife said, um, we, we think Alex has got a little bit of a fever. So we checked him out. No big deal. It was slightly elevated. All right? It was 99.8 you know, or whatever the case is. And at the time when he was 11 months old, we, we kind of thought he was teething, you know, teeth come through the gum. Sometimes you get little small infections. We didn't think anything of it. And so we quickly dismissed it for that day. Next day, his fever kept on going up a little bit, a little bit. So we took him into the, to the doctors and the doctor said, ah, we think it's just a virus. And, uh, you know, you guys can go on. And if it doesn't get better, come back in a couple of days. So that's what happened. And the fever kept on going a little bit higher and higher. So we came back two days later and now the fever started being a little bit concerned because when every time we gave him Advil and Tylenol, it wouldn't, the fever wouldn't drop. And the doctor kind of reassured us again. Uh, we think it's just, uh, you know, just a normal virus. Now we were testing at the time as coronavirus is going on. Back then it was N1, uh, H, H1N1. And so we, we tested him for that. And luckily it wasn't that. Uh, but it ended up being something a lot worse, actually. Um, so we went back home. And then on this day number five or day six um, we went back to the pediatrician we said doctor we don't like the way the fever is going you know he's sitting at over 103 fever and uh, it just keeps on going up and up so the doctor at the time said go ahead and go down to Cincinnati Children's Hospital and go ahead and get him admitted so I remember checking him in um, to the hospital I'm holding Alex um, in the lobby and it's in air conditioning at the time and it's in August and so um, He's like a little oven that I'm holding. I'm actually sweating as I'm holding him. We finally get him into the room and we put him onto the table and we meet our nurse. And the nurse, first thing she does is she checks his, checks his temperature and she has a, a little lanyard with a chart on, the, on it and it flips it from Celsius and Fahrenheit and they do the conversions that way. And she takes the temperature and she looks a little bit puzzled. And you never want people in the medical field to look puzzled. And she kind of looked at her lanyard and looked up and looked at her lanyard again and looked up. And I said to her, I said, how high is it? And she says it's 105.6. And 105.6 is obviously extremely dangerous, um, especially for somebody, you know, my age, you know, that, that could be, that could be fatal. Uh, but luckily for 11 month old, they're a lot more resilient. Anyway, so we did multiple, multiple, multiple tests. And every time we were doing these tests, his platelet levels were constantly rising. Normally, you guys were said about 200,000 um, per milliliter, cubic milliliter of blood. Well, his went from 200,000 to 400,000, 600,000, 800,000. And finally, 
on the last day, he was sitting at 1.2 million. So you can understand how dangerous platelets can be in terms of clotting. Luckily, at the time of 11 month old, we don't worry about heart attacks typically um, because they're obviously their arteries are completely open. Um, and as we talked about collateral circulation, where they would close, and collateral circulation that keeps you uh, alive, we don't worry about that with the 11 month old. But anyway, he was diagnosed with something called Kawasaki's disease, and we had to do a procedure for him. It took a 12 hour procedure, and uh, I won't get into all the details because I know you want this video short, but let me show you a little, couple of little clips. Here, this is Alex at the time, right before he he had his uh, his procedure and was diagnosed with Kawasaki's disease. And this is Alex, make a long story short, he's fine, he's healthy, he, he's all good. This was him right after Kawasaki's disease, about a month later. And uh, to make this video authentic, I wanted to bring Alex in. Uh, so my son, like, well, you don't get to normally do this at school. I'm bringing Alex in. So come on in here, Alex. All right. So Alex, this is this is Alex, and uh, why don't you tell them a couple of things about what you're doing now and what you can do, what you can't do, how Kawasaki's um, has it limited yet in any way? So go ahead and explain. Um, my name is Alex. Um, I'm a fifth grader. Um, I can do three sports perfectly fine like any other fifth grader. Um, yeah. yeah, so it hasn't had any limitations. As we had to go back for three years of checking, um, doing ultrasounds of his heart, and to make sure that there wasn't any damage due to it. And luckily, three years after um, after this picture, he got a clean bill of health, and he was good to go. And uh, so he's been he's been active little boy ever since. Uh, really, about you know the first grade of, of trying to play three different sports. So, uh, all right, thanks, bud. All right, anyway, going back on to today's lesson. Um, so let, let me go through this pretty fast. Today we were going to talk, or Friday we talked about the brain and talked about lobes of the brain. And uh, so we're going to get into mental illness right now. And the first one that we're going to talk about is something that you probably guys have all heard, and that's Parkinson's. And Parkinson's is a disease that affects about 10 million people worldwide, but about 1 million people in the United States. And uh, if you know anybody with Parkinson's, usually it's an onset later in life. Normally we don't see Parkinson's early. Um, usually after 65 is when you would normally see something like that. And oftentimes it's the shaking uncontrollable. And it might start off with something small in the hand or fingers, which we call little small tremors, but then they progress, it constantly gets worse. So it might just be with a hand and then it might be a shaking of the entire arm Maybe it might go to one entire side of the body or one half the body where it makes them um, unable to control certain types of movements, make it very difficult to walk. It can also make it very difficult to talk because they don't have the, this type of control. And the one thing that we've realized um, is it's because of three reasons. Either A, too little dopamine, and we talked about that neurotransmitter a little bit um, on Friday, those neurotransmitters. Dopamine, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, you, it could be also genetics, um, or it could be head trauma. And a lot of times people all naturally assume, Par assume Parkinson's with head trauma, especially about three years ago, because one of the most famous people, um, at least athletes that we know of, Muhammad Ali, was diagnosed with Parkinson's. Um, you might also remember somebody um, like Michael J. Fox, the actor from Back to the Future, who has Parkinson's. So I'm gonna leave two video clips in the comments below if you wanna watch anything about Muhammad Ali or Michael J. Fox. I certainly encourage you to watch Michael J. Fox because there's a video of before and after. So when he's 1991-ish, when he was filming Back to the Future, and then where he is, you know, whatever it was, 10, 14 years later. So anyway, so dopamine, let's get to that briefly. Now you guys, Dopamine applies even to you all right now. You guys receive dopamine anytime you get something positive, okay? Something that you like. But we can get dopamine other different ways. We can get through sunlight. We can get through exercise. We can get through the things that we eat, meats and proteins and almonds, great sources of, of, uh, of dopamine. Get good sleep, all right? Sleep is, a, is an important thing for dopamine. Um, if you want to meditate, listen to music, uh, vitamin D, all positive things for dopamine. So I strongly always encourage you to do that. That's that neurotransmitter that affects our mood. Um, so sometimes it's gloomy to be stuck indoors all day long. Please get out and outside and exercise. Certainly get your sunlight and get your sleep. 
The next thing um, we want to talk about is schizophrenia, another type of mental um, disorder. And I'll leave another two videos down below in the comment section on schizophrenia. Don't have to watch it all, just watch certainly parts of it. Um, but schizophrenia, we get about one to two percent of our society that is diagnosed with schizophrenia. We know that there is a higher chance of schizophrenia if your parents had it. You're about 10% more likely to have it. Again, because your parents have schizophrenia doesn't mean you're going to get it. Heck, you're 90% likely that you're not going to get it. But we do see a higher case, 10% of those, uh, those the, excuse me, the offspring perhaps might have it. Um, well, what happens with schizophrenia? We hallucinate. Well, what's a hallucination? We oftentimes see things or hear things and we hear things a lot more than we see things. That's a common um, hallucination is hearing. Um, another demographic that's a little bit higher in schizophrenia is homeless people. And we don't really necessarily know, is it because they were homeless that they developed schizophrenia? Or was did they have schizophrenia and they're having a hard time holding down jobs, holding, keeping a family together, and then they became homeless? So we really don't know is the chicken or the egg, which one really came first when it comes to, to homeless people with schizophrenia. Um, but typically schizophrenia is uh, a little bit later on in life, usually in your 20s or 30s that you would develop schizophrenia. Very rare for somebody um, elementary age, and it's very rare for somebody um, that would be an elderly person having schizophrenia. They're probably having some other type of dementia if that was the case. Um, schizophrenia, Schizophrenia is sometimes hard to medicate because it gets people in a fog and they don't they don't enjoy that feeling um, As well as they oftentimes gain weight. So a lot of times people get off their meds But there's one type of schizophrenia that's even a little bit more concerning than just normal schizophrenia And that's called paranoid schizophrenia and when you're paranoid Oftentimes you're either fearful of your own life or fearful of somebody else's life and they are having a really really hard time to determining what is a threat to them and what is not. So um, please do me a favor, watch a video clip that I will leave in the comments. Um, it's from A Beautiful Mind. It's a true story about a guy with schizophrenia named John Nash. And uh, um, I don't know if I necessarily have to show you, explain the scene, but just please keep in mind that the baby is real in that. Um, John obviously is a real person in that and uh, the wife is real. Everybody else is a hallucination. So you can kind of see how paranoid schizophrenia could take effect. Um, so I hopefully kept that a little bit shorter than normal. Um, feel free to write down some notes. Anyway, we will have a test certainly on Thursday or Friday. I think Thursday or Friday this week, I will certainly let you know, and, but you can use your notes and whatever you need to um, for the test. If you have any questions feel free to contact me email me do whatever we'll get through this guys i promise and uh you guys are an awesome group i'm just so disappointed that i'm not in your class standing up in front of you teaching you because you guys are awesome um, i love you guys to death and uh, you guys be good be safe and uh, we wish you well thanks